August 16, 2021, the day the U.S. military and all State Department forces initiated an emergency evacuation of the remaining personnel of the NATO compound at H. Kaya, Kabul, Afghanistan. There's a lot of folks out there that want to know how it all went down. Tell the story and to tell it the way it should be told, the right way. We got to go back to the beginning. Not just the beginning and the end, how I got into this chaos in the first place. So this is my story. The fall of Kabul, the one year anniversary. August 16th, 2021, the day that myself and many others were evacuated by C-130, C-17, and various other military transport aircraft out of Kabul, Afghanistan. All right, guys, it's 0527 local on the 16th of August. This is the emergency evacuation of Kabul. This is Saigon 2021. What's up, man? Good, good. Everybody's ready to bail the fuck out of here. Okay, so let's roll back the clocks. Going back to the beginning, if you will or I should say a new beginning. So it was December of 2014 when I received my coveted DD-214. Some of you may ask, what's a DD-214? It's the document that you receive when you complete your required act of federal service in the United States military. With that, I was a free man again. I survived, I made it. Got an honorable discharge. <laughs> Relatively unscathed, but got into some trouble here and there, but nothing too major. Anyway, months prior to finishing my time in the Army, I had just gotten home from Afghanistan from a tour, from Kandahar specifically. And never would I thought that months later I would be right back in the same exact place that I was. So, where it began for me is kind of ironic. I knew there were contractors out there. I had talked to some contractors and really piqued my interest because we were getting kind of shipped for pay as an enlisted guy or gal doing our duty, doing our thing, and the military. And yet, we got these contractors that are civilian folks that go overseas, they got the right background, they got the right pedigree, and some of them are making a thousand US dollars a day. It is insane. Now, it's not like the old days by this time, but still, people were making pretty good money. Anyway, I had known several folks didn't really have 
like an in or knew anybody specifically like a recruiter or a hiring manager or anything to that effect. So browse on Facebook, the coveted in my profession without giving you an autobiography. Facebook group called Arm of the Dark, right? Because I'm an armored guy, small arms, cruiser, weapons, aircraft armaments. Fires a bullet or a round, chances are I've had a hand in it in one way, shape, or form. But anyway, there was a Facebook post. And at this point, I was on terminal leave, finishing my final leave from the Army. And it was a crumpled up piece of paper with some guy's email address on it. They said, You want to make 150 grand a year? Send this guy an email. You've got to be willing to work. In Afghanistan, Kuwait, or Iraq, and all like, huh, interesting. So I sent an email, right? Thinking that, yeah, this is probably some BS or something to that effect. So, nighttime in the US, daytime overseas, I send this thing. I get a reply back in like seven minutes, like, lickety split. And I was like, that's unusual. And the guy says, all right, tell me about your background. Give me a brief overview, you know, of who you are. And I was kind of blunt my first email. I said, is this a hoax? Is this a lie? Is this legit? He said, no, it's legit. Uh, we need people who are hurting. There was a manning shortage on that particular contract at the time. So anyway, uh, gave him my overview, he's like, all right, send me a resume, send him a resume. And at that point, I was no subject matter expert writing a resume. I got the basic kind of, uh, they called it ACAP back then, but now it's called TAP, I think. Process of getting out of the Army, it was like a rough deal. I mean, it was like, a, all right, check the block, get out of here, sort of thing. So I sent it the thing. He said, all right, change these couple lines, and I did, and he's like, all right, you're going to call from the corporate recruiter tomorrow, and no shit I did. I got a call, and they said, hey, welcome aboard, you're going to get a foreign service agreement, we need you to leave in five days, and you got to have tools, and all this, I was like, whoa, hold up, coach, like, I still have to get all the necessary tools that we needed for that specific contract. So, long story short, got delayed a little bit. So I ended up finally going to pre-deployment, a uh, place called the IDC. For those in the contracting world, they know exactly what the IDC is. There's several sites in the U.S. There's one at Camp Atterbury, one at Fort Lewis, Texas. I happened to go down to Fort Worth. Stayed in the hotel with that house. It was one of the nicest the IDC to be at, like Atterbury or Bliss to blow off with that shit. Nothing special there. Anyway, you know, depending on the contract, maybe a range qual, medical, uh, SRT process, just like you would do in the military. It's very similar. So, spent about a week and some change there. Boarded the plane, got on that thing. want to say it was day after Christmas in December, and then get all the prep and pre-deployment done, and I want to say by, I think it was the 5th or 6th of January, I was boarding the flight from Terminal 2 in Dubai to land commercial in Kandahar, Afghanistan for this new contract, and I already knew the territory, I already been there, knew the base, knew the building. Nothing was going to be new. Hell, even the job wasn't new. It was just okay, not wearing a uniform anymore. No big deal, whatever. So, got on the plane. It was like zero dark 30 when I got on that thing. It was like 4.35 in the morning. And the way they kind of have it set up is you do a ring route with these fly Dubai flights, right? You go to Bagram, and then once you land in Bagram, people get off, people get on, because you got people leaving contract, coming on contract, going on leave, coming back off of leave. It's 
it's kind of a process. So Bagram and Kandahar is where they would always go with this ring rock. Right. So then a way to Bagram, get to Kandahar, is like maybe eight, nine in the morning. I get off the plane to Kandahar. So I get picked up by the site supervisor, right? The guy kind of running and overseeing the contract in Kandahar. There's multiple layers of bosses and higher echelons because this was quite a significant and large contract at the time. Well paid, you know, decent pay compared to other contracts in the past, but you know, you worked your ass off over there. It was seven days a week, 12 hours a day. You know, it was kind of rough in the beginning. Anyway, Jim picked me up. We'll just call him Jim. So Jim picks me up. Says, hey, welcome aboard. Glad to have you. We're short an armored guy. Actually, short several, and I didn't know that at the time, but I get there. Got put in the mods, and before I had lived in the, what they call RLBs, or relocatable buildings, if you will. I lived in Site 4, Pad 8, Room 26, on Kandar Airfield, right? And uh, worked on Mustang Ring. Mustang or Panther, you know, possibly between those two spots, but that's primarily where I was on that base. Not really close to those that know Niagara, DFAC, or PX, but there was a big footprint when I was there in the Army. And then when I came back, it was like mind blowing. I come back, the boardwalk looks like a ghost town. Everything was like shut down. I got put into mod housing. My first mod that I lived in was. 5766. So I get there, get my stuff situated, put it in the room. I kind of get settled in, and the next day it's game time, time to go to work. I was on day shift for maybe about a week, kind of doing the in processing, the required training that everyone had to have to be on the contract so that if we got an audit, that we wouldn't get any discrepancies or any gigs against the contract, which is not a good thing to get the call of the cars, but I won't go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, then I got put on night shift, so worked with the guy briefly who was kind of leaving the contract, didn't know at the time, but he was going to leave it sooner. So there I was, my MOS, AFSC rate, those that are military background, being the armored guy, I was kind of like, my back was up against the wall, against the road, got a shitload of work. I was the only guy doing a lot of work maintaining these weapon systems. This particular contract was Apache attack helicopters, the armament and weapon systems on there, and then dabbling in troubleshooting, avionics, sighting systems, out whole shebang. A lot of aircraft there. 82nd Airborne was there when I first got there. And then 101st came in later. But there was 24 helicopters there. And that's a shitload of work and they're flying a lot of hours. Not necessarily shooting a lot, but flying a lot of hours. So not really seeing a lot of round space maintenance, but we're seeing your scheduled maintenance, your scheduled inspections. So they get done every so often based on flight hours or calendar date, normal, unless there's some sort of special inspection required. Right? Anyway, did that for about a year. That was my first contract, getting my foot in the door, got it done, and then of course I was like, all right, I kind of figured this out. Seen the dark side now, of you know, you work hard, you're getting a shitload of money, making over 10 G's a month, I was like, shit, this is amazing, right? But there's better stuff out there, so I pushed and continued to network, and before I know it, I got an offer, same sort of contract, however, with a different operation, kind of a smaller aircraft, special operations type aircraft, they're just going to be kind of trained and then fives to maintain foreign military assets, right? That was an amazing contract. Great schedule, you got a day off a week, you got 
a 90-30 leave. You work 90 days and then you go for a 30-day leave. Incredible contract. That was just badass. You know, got to do a lot of cool stuff. Um, did that for a while, worked with some other folks, did some small arm stuff on that end as well. And kind of really diversifying the uh, experience from kind of a regular army. I said like, okay, you know, I had trained foreign military personnel before in Iraq. This is kind of a cool gig, but actually getting paid for the job. It is so rewarding getting this big money versus having to toil and sweat for like little to no money and you're just basically surviving. There's no way to thrive as an enlisted Joe or James. Unless you do a full career, usually it's a miserable 20 years and then by the end of your time it looks like you got the life sucked out of you and all you want to do is like curl up and die. So a lot of those folks end up in that sort of situation. Anyway, so I stayed on that contract for about three years. Took a short break, took a stateside gig for about 10 months, it wasn't long. Went to Saudi for a little bit, did some contracting work over there. Then I'm back in action, went back to Afghanistan. Doing stuff with Blackhawk helicopters, maintaining cruiser weapons, primarily M240s and unit small arms as well as special forces and special operations weapons, which was amazing. Uh, the teams there were incredible without going into details, but the maintenance guys there doing stuff with their, what they had going on, just top notch. So um, that was an awesome gig, did that for all the way up until it was the end of the road, so one of the most monumental failures in United States military history. It's no secret that the U.S. government and the U.S. military will go and dwell in foreign places and try to nation build, build partnerships, friendships. Afghanistan was something that blew up into something that it may or may not need to have blown up to what it was. But it ended up being a disaster in the end. And we didn't learn our lessons from Vietnam. We were in Vietnam for half the time we were in Afghanistan and that still failed. So what does that tell you? You know, you don't realize, recognize what happens historically, but you're doomed to repeat it. It's the old proverb or something to that effect. Anyway, um, you know, the contract changed hands, changed companies, a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of political crap that goes on in contracts. However, you're getting paid a shitload of money, so who cares? You know, you're paid so well that it's like, all right, I can handle and tolerate an acceptable level of bullshit. You know, there's no formations, schedules on you. Even though I'm kind of a broke dick now, being post-military service, you do what you can and do the best you can, and you know, you're getting a lot of money for it. So, call us hired guns, you know, smirks, whatever you want to call us, but the U.S. government awards the contracts to private companies, they take them, because it's a unique mission that the military or the government doesn't necessarily want to do on their own because one, it'll be too costly, not an economical, right, to keep entire units there, constantly deploying, redeploying, when you can hire a handful of people to take care of the mission and pay them a lot more money, but in the grand scheme of things in the long run, they're saving a shitload of cash. So it's a win-win on both ends, right? Blackwater tried that, but they got burned. Situations happened where they kind of got blackballed from the whole game based on the State Department contracts and some of the things that happened with that company. I never personally worked with Blackwater, any of their subsidiaries, but they got burned. Um, and if you want more details about that, I recommend you check out 
um, Sean Bryan's podcast. He's interviewed the Blackwater guys, and it's an incredible story. But, yeah, I mean, the concept is there. So, one, too costly. That would not be long-winded. That was definitely long-winded. And two, it's a mission that you have to build partnerships with. So when you constantly deploy and redeploy people all the time and you don't have any assets that are there long term, aside from like embassy people, which never have anything to do with the missions that we were kind of supporting. You know, they're more diplomats than anything else. We're working with the actual grunts that are making it happen on the ground, pounding the pavement, keeping birds in the air, keeping the weapons in the fight, keeping the enemy at bay at a distance from all of the security areas. You know, having a long-term presence where you're able to interface with those folks, I I think is more effective than just constantly deploying and redeploying people every six or nine months, four years, depending on what it is, what that year is. So there's that, but no one anticipated that Afghanistan would last for 20 years. Okay, so those are the two primary considerations when you want to hire a private entity to, you know, you want to call it doing their bidding, call it whatever you want, but essentially contracting it out, right? From DOD, State Department, intelligence agencies, there's all kinds of contracts out there. So all this leads up into the spring and summer of 2021. So under the Trump administration, he wanted everyone out by Christmas of 2020. There is no way in hell that could happen. Here's why. Even with all of the airlift assets that the US military has, primarily fixed wing, because you need heavy lift to get people and equipment out. It would have taken them doing sorties every single day, around the clock, 24-7, to get all that stuff and people out, to draw it down by Christmas. It was not feasible. If you did it every day with every available asset, I recall hearing the effect of, it would be at least April of 21 before all of that could happen. So eventually that plan got scrubbed. There's a lot of politics involved. Politics are divisive. I stay away from politics. So I'm really not going to comment on the political considerations, but without going down that rabbit hole, that was originally the push and why we left Afghanistan. It originally started under the Trump administration. So in January, 2021, we have a new administration. Joe Biden has sworn in as president. He keeps the same military hierarchy, if you will, that was under the Trump administration. So nothing really changed drastically, right? It was still kind of the same thing, just the timeline had to shift. So an arbitrary decision was made that, okay, here's the deal. September 11th, everybody's gonna be out. And they already had troops shrink down to alleged 2,500 troops by certain dates and times. And it was already skeleton proof, right? Compared to when I was there in the army, I mean, there was like, it was a ghost town. Not a lot of people there at all. So if things went down, worst case scenario, I was ready to shake and bake with an M240 and as much ammo as I could carry. Right, it, it really fell apart. But I digress, that didn't happen. It did fall apart, but we were able to get out. We were able to get a flight, thank God. So, timeline gets pressed. The Taliban becomes more bold by, okay, we kind of got these guys on the run where they're drawing down, they're drawing down defense assets, personnel. They're not dumb. They see everything going on with all the bases. I've been all over Afghanistan. Within my last few months there, shit, I've been everywhere. I've been to Shorab when it closed. 
which used to be Bastion back in the day, but they closed Bastion now with a $2 billion base. One of the largest ever built. It's an incredible thing that they built there, but it all went to shit and they closed it down. And after it was turned over to Afghans, it was a disaster. So that didn't materialize. The Americans kept a small compound called Shorab. I was there, we got evacuated out of there when we had the, the Special Forces team there, their colonel, put us on the C-130. We had to get out of there. And I'd been in CAF and Kabul before, spent quite a bit of time in Kabul, been up to Kabul, going down to CAF. My primary mission for years was Kandahar. That's primarily where I was, but I've been all over. And then CAF shuts down. And then the day that Bagram shuts down, they didn't really have a handover, a legit handover of anything with the Afghans. They just fucking left. It was wild. The same day that Bagram is a ghost town and that was announced on all the cable news networks, no shit, and I'll put pictures in the video. There was a Chinese IL-76 that lands and drops off God knows what. But that was just the first one that I saw when I was in Kabul. I was on the Special Mission Wing Ramp 6 where I worked. Small special operations asset of helicopters and armaments there. And I whipped out my phone, same phone that I'm recording on right now, and I took pictures of the damn thing. Same day that Bagram gets closed down, no notes. It's kind of ironic, huh, well, when China's already said, yeah, we're going to be kind of allies with these folks and kind of capitalize on what's going on. I mean, there's no secret there. But I was just like, holy shit, this is really happening. So when that happened, like, all right, things are looking so great, you know, and I think it was a stupid move, and I agree with Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller that they should not have done an evacuation from Kabul, but they should have in Bagram. That was like the landmark. We started in Bagram, we should have finished in Bagram. I don't know why they didn't do that, but it was a boneheaded move in my opinion. Anyway, so fast forward, okay, other bases are getting fucked up, they're getting hit, and things are not looking good, there's firefights, there's more territory being gained by all the enemy forces, before we know it, just maybe a week out, okay, you know, Taliban is pretty much surrounded the wall. 150, 200 miles out on all sides. Like, oh shit, you know. By this time, it's like July time for you, right? I was living in the Baron Hotel, the same Baron Hotel that was blown up, that killed all those Marines, which was so tragic. But we were ordered, I want to say if I remember right, the date was June 26, 2021. We were ordered by the combatant commander of Kabul that all U.S. military contractors will move on to post, whoever's living outside post. The Baron was amazing. You had your own room in most cases. Some cases were doubled up. You had a bar, a pool, you had a couple of gyms. I mean, it was an amazing thing to have like a four-star hotel in Afghanistan, like live at large, it was insane, had an awesome restaurant, which was our dining facility, so everyone was pissed when we had to move on the base, we're like, oh shit, but I'm glad we did look it back on it, because it probably was the right decision based on the threat consideration, the risk assessment, so I want to say it was June 26th, we move on to HKS. I moved, if I remember right, I was in building 403. Previously, back contracts in the past, I lived in building 404, right? So the 400 series buildings there, they're like rocket proof buildings, so to speak, even though I kind of question that, but supposedly rocket proof buildings. Anyway, moved on to base. All right, things are looking like we're gonna wind down, so we're packing a lot of stuff up, shipping it, they're talking about over the horizon mission, right? 
they're talking about we're going to still support these guys, but we're going to do it from like the United Arab Emirates, right? I think LA is where they were talking about. And that's what the Biden administration was talking about as well, both on the diplomatic side and on the military and DOD side. Anyway, so August comes around, and that first week in August is not looking good. We are working with Afghans where their families are starting to get flat out murdered, raped, killed, like bad things are happening. We had an air crew member get sticky bomb, like, you know, driving home from work. Taliban has biometrics at this point, so they can ID who's working with the Americans. So they sticky bombed one of our pilots, killed the guy, you know, trying to fight on the right side of history. So we're like, holy oh, shit, this is, it's at home now. You know, guys that we're working with are going into hiding, people are starting to disappear, kind of lay low. A lot of people were saying, we'll take off our uniform, burn them, kind of lay low. Like, it was wild. We're like, oh, shit. So, we knew things were going to shit. And this leads up until it's the 15th of August. Sorry, the 14th of August. Have to think back a year now. It's not all that long ago, but text times. Basically, at that time, we were like, all right, you know, the Taliban's like 30 miles out, that is what the latest intel does. So they were briefed and through the chain of commands and passed it down to the site supervisor for the contracts. So we're like, damn. You know, we were thinking about, since we had several pilots on our contract, the Afghans had what they call PC-12s, which it's like a single engine, turboprop, airplane that could hold like maximum like 10 people maybe. Anyway, we calculated on a full tank of fuel, it would barely make it to Dubai. So like we were thinking, all right, worst case scenario, we have one of these pilots, we basically steal or jack a PC-12 if things really went to shit, just think through our minds, like, because there's no commitment or there's no um, guarantee or even, like, word from the U.S. military, like, they're not liable for us, like, we're civilians, they have nothing to do with us, so we're kind of, like, on our own. At that point, we didn't know about any plans or getting troops there, reinforcements, because at this point, there had to have been like 500 people total living on our HKIA compound as far as like military and armed security and all that stuff, and then us contractors supporting the, the missions going on there. And we were just brainstorming like, things really go to shit, we're gonna have no choice but to steal a fucking plane and get out of there. Like, we would have never considered something like that in normal circumstances. It was wild, but doing the calculation for weight and balance, fuel burn, you know, the Pilatus PC-12, that aircraft I was telling you about, it's got a Pratt & Whitney PC-6 internal shaft engine, and uh, just coming up with some sort of basic plan, like, all right, you know, things go to shit, at least, we got some game plans so we could hopefully get out of here without getting shot down by some surface to air asset if the Taliban did have that stuff. So, finally, on the 15th, 15th of August, the Taliban was on the airfield when we were told like they're like 10 miles out. They were on the airport property, on the grounds of I'm in Karzai International Airport, starting to raise white flags, like we're victorious. And honestly, the Afghan army really isn't doing anything to stop them. I mean, at that point, we haven't heard any gun battles or any anything to that effect. So the other thing is, like, who's who in this whole thing? Like, who's on what side? That was another thing that was not a comfortable spot to be on. So when that started happening, the 
State Department security, and I think uh, the contractors, Garda World, I think was the company, came to the shop and was like, hey, we got to go right now. And the uh, lead guy for us was like, hey, you got to get out right now. And we're like, what? Like, so we handed over aircraft logbooks, records, keys, all that stuff to one of the Afghan lieutenants, and we're like, good luck. And it was like the sorriest, saddest sight you could ever see. But we got put on Kai and they're like, stand fast. We don't know what the hell is going on, but you know, we're looking at booking tickets to get out of there. And my personal self, I had already booked a ticket through Emirates to try to get out of there. However, I think it was that day or the day before they actually canceled flights leaving Kabul. You could only take one of the, I think it was Safi and a couple other airlines that were flying out of there. But when that got canceled, we're like, fuck. Oh and the contract was trying to get us tickets, so now we're like really thinking like, man, are we really gonna have to steal a fucking plane? Like, what the fuck? There's no mention of any C-17s or nothing at this point. The day before, we're gonna get on a C-17 and leave, where people are gonna be hanging on side of a fucking aircraft, hanging out for dear life to try to get out of there, because they're so desperate to, to flee because they know the type of murderous, terrible, sadistic things that this regime does. So anyway, just fucking bizarre. So that night, shots rang out right outside the perimeter. I was actually in my building in 403. Gunfight breaks out right outside. I'm like, fuck, this is not good. So snipers started taking pot shots onto the base for like, holy shit. By that point, I want to say about maybe a thousand or 1500 between troops and Marines that showed up at that point. So there was a contingency plan ongoing, but we were not, there's no public knowledge to do that at that particular time. Like we didn't know that was like a thing, but that was all going on behind the scenes. They're bringing in assets. So anyway, they send out quick reaction force teams to combat that. Um, when we left the building like to get chow that night, I remember we had to wear our body armor just to go get chow. Um, they were taking shots at anything that moved down to the base, anything I could see from the high rise buildings around. Um, so yeah, what a fucking disaster. And at that point, there's still no guarantee that we're getting out of there at all. We're like, fuck, we were just told pack your shit. And that's it, like, get your shit ready to go, but we really don't know what's gonna happen because they already canceled commercial flights by that point. So by this time, it was like 20 hundred for Zapion and um, in Kabul and uh, I was just thinking, man, this could be it. You know, you never know because Taliban have over 100,000 strong, completely surrounded, and by that point, they're like right there. You know, the three days leading up to that was the most massive helicopter entourage evacuation in history. I mean, it made Saigon look like child's play. And I get it, Saigon taking people off the roofs there to a carrier strike group. The difference was, the State Department had like four CH-46s, they had a couple UH-60s, the Army had, I want to say, two UH-60s, a couple 47s, they had a couple 64s, and like that was it. But it was like three solid days of non-stop evacuating people from the American Embassy, which is within seven miles of h on the airport there. But it was just crazy the amount of people they brought on the base and evacuated. So anyway, that was going on leading up to this, and they were already getting those people out there, but there was no plan for us to like pretty much fucking on our own. I mean, we signed the dotted lines, no one was holding a gun to our heads saying like, we gotta do this. We accepted the risk, that's why they pay us big money. So we did, and we put ourselves in that situation. So it's something that we had to live with whatever happened, happened, right? So at that point, we got word that okay, the 06 over our contract is working with elements of the hierarchy there. 
the combatant commands, you know, the highest levels at that point, which I don't think we had any general officers on the ground. It was only like an 06 level um, at the time. But to get us milling, basically, C-130, C-17, we didn't know at the time, but they're like, pack your ship, be ready to go. And that was the situation. So we packed up our rooms, hell, I, I still have my room key, didn't even turn shit in. Got all my badging and everything from me, Chikai, my attack badge, all that stuff. Um, still have it to this day. Anyway. Uh, so we're ready to go. Everyone's kind of just staging outside the barracks. The buildings there, I call it the barracks, but hey, military guy, fuck are you gonna call it? Anyway, um, just kind of uncertainties in the air. We end up waiting all night. And next day they're like, all right, you know, go to the PAX terminal, pass the terminal. And I'll clip in some B-roll footage from that morning and that night. Um, and we're there, our contract oversight reps are there. Uh, they're the government employees that are civilian employees, but the liaise between the military and us. And they reassured, yeah, we're getting your flight and all this. And by that time, I think there was like 10 C-17 sitting on the ramp. There was a lot of shit. They brought in a whole battalion of 160 and special operations, ABs, and regiment, like overnight. Right? Their motto, I think, is plus or minus 30 seconds. Um, time on target, which is like an incredible thing to achieve for aviation. You know, put the special ops guys, they're supposed to be the best of the best. But they had Little Birds, they had Arm 47s, they had Daps, Blackhawks, I mean, they had the whole shebang. So I was like, holy shit. So thank God for those guys, and thank God for all the Army infantry units and the Marine Corps units that were there, like, lickety split. So at that point, we felt a little bit, felt finally. Okay, we can take a breath of fresh air. We're not out of the woods yet, but we're getting out of here. So we end up having it out processed through the Marine Corps. They gave us some fucking bracelet to track us wherever we're going to go. We didn't know what the fuck was going to happen at the time. And meanwhile, on the second floor of the PAX terminal outside where the smoking area was, they had a bunch of people like lined up across the airfield. No one knew at the time what was going on, but they put a lot of these guys on their knees. And, you know, we started hearing pops in the distance, and, you know, there were guns trained at that area over near the terminal, the actual cool commercial terminal. And it looked like they were executing soldiers. And the Marines told us, hey, get the fuck back inside before you go. And I'm like, whatever. But, you know, they were running the show. Who cares? It's not like we've never heard gunfire before. They weren't shooting at us. But, like living on planet Mars, like holy shit, you're actually seeing this, you know, first cam unfold. So yeah, uh, finally, you know, they're like, all right, you know, got a plane assigned for you. So basically, we filled that fucking plane through this full. Um, you see a lot of pictures from just the crazy shit that happened. People hanging off. They had to kind of taxi and go back and forth and try to avoid the crowds, they had Apaches kind of buzzing people to try to get them away from the C-17 so they could take off without hurting or killing any of these civilians. It was just such a fucking bizarre situation. So we kind of do a combat departure, a very steep angle of attack, getting out of there, which is understandable because, you know, it could be valid surface air threats, not an intel guy, but I'm thinking that is what went down. So we got out of there, didn't know where the fuck we were going. We were just told, get on this tail number, get on this plane, cool. So everyone kind of followed the loadmasters onto the C-17. So we land, we're on this fucking plane for hours after we land. We didn't know at the time where we were, but finally, like, it made sense when we got out of the plane. We were at al which is Qatar, Qatar. Um, Air Force Base there. They really didn't know what to do with us because we're not there of our own accord. We didn't leave Kabul with proper exit procedures with our passports since we're there working on a visa and whatnot. So the government of Qatar wanted nothing to do with us. And the State Department people said that. And it was kind of funny because we we're kind of pressuring the State Department diplomat there. 
he was kind of like, well, this decision's like big state. Like, oh, you think this is such a fucking big deal, but we're trying to get out of there and maybe go to the commercial terminal and cutter so we can board our own flights and go home, you know? Shit, but no, that didn't fucking work. So we ended up staying there, I think, two days before we pretty much got treated like fucking like inmates like lack of a better term like minimum security because like we can't go anywhere of our own free will so they end up getting us a Qatar Airways flight to Kuwait and then we get to Kuwait the main street is like inmates but we didn't like go into Kuwait at all we just got on another plane but we got on a Kuwait Airlines I can't remember if it was a triple seven or um, an A380, but we got on this plane, they searched all of our ship, and the embassy officials there from the State Department were there, kind of did like a minor quick like debrief, give you, hey, this is what's going on, go to this line, they're going to search your ship, you're going to get on this plane, you're going to get the fuck out of here, cool. Didn't know we were going to Dulles, but got out of there, you know, direct flight from there to Dulles, can't remember how many hours it is, but we're all used to long flights anyway, going back and forth for R&R uh, &R leave um, for our contracts. Land in Dulles and uh, get there finally, like thank God, back on American soil. And uh, the bar there on that lower level where arrivals are and the baggage claim is, I had been there before, but it was like fucking nine in the morning if I remember right. And the place didn't open till 10. And I'm trying to go to Michigan, where I'm from, right? So we were told, stand fast, contract's gonna get your tickets home. We're just happy to be in the US, like, hey, no big deal, whatever. Take your time, we don't give a shit. We're, we're home. It's all that fucking matters. We got out of it. And so we go to this bar and we're just kind of waiting for it to open and this guy appears and they start shooting the ship with all of us. It's a group of like maybe 10 or 12 of us. I remember without, you know, going into the detail, I remember there was a guy named Chris, Johnny, Jeremy, and a few others from our conference just kind of bullshit and just waiting for this bar to open. And uh, this guy just walks up, thought he worked for the bar, talking to us. Didn't think anything of it, so I was talking to this guy, and finally I was last like, hey, you know, we've been talking for about 10, 15 minutes now. I'd like a yingling. Could I get a pint, you know? And he said, actually, uh, I work for NBC. I'm with the news, and I was like, oh, okay. And uh, he turns to Chris, and he was like, I wanna, I'd like to interview one of y'all. And uh, Chris was like, nope, and he turns other people, nope, and here I am. I'm like, fuck. And contractors do not like when you talk to the media, so I'm like, I gotta be really careful on this one. So, out of nowhere, this fucking guy emerges with a big ass camera. I'm holding this menu, looking at what's on the menu, beer selection and whatnot. And uh, they just go right into an interview asking me questions about what the hell happened, um, I'll roll in footage from the news where I was interviewed and I pretty much told them how it was, look, this was exactly like Saigon, the only difference is we didn't have helicopters evacuate all these people to carry their strike route, but it was three solid days of sorties, it was ridiculous, the amount of sorties that got flown to take that many people onto HKI, rumor is it was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people like way bigger proportion than supposedly even Saigon was, right? You know, Saigon happened in 1975. And then when North Vietnamese took Saigon, they renamed it and to the state's Ho Chi Minh City. But basically laid it on, didn't mention the contractor once and, um, you know, called it a day. Got my beard, finally got the tickets to uh, go home, got on the plane, no issues, and uh, finally made it home. And later on, um, I think I was in a connecting flight either in Detroit or somewhere. And uh, 
My brother had sent me a thing like, hey dude, you were the news. They published that thing in the fucking news. I was like, oh shit. So I got a text from the contractor saying, hey, here's the social media and the media policy and all that, but didn't mention their names once who I was working for, so there was no, no harm, no foul there. And uh, yeah, that's it. And then the rest is history. You know, the Marine Corps stayed there to try to get as many civilian folks, interpreters, people that have worked with us side by side um, for the last however many years to try to get them out of there. And ultimately, Marines paid the price when that hotel was blown up outside the Abbey Gate, which that was my regular route of travel for many months. It was insane. You know, we took an armored convoy from the hotel to the gate and then on the post going through a series of checkpoints so just what a colossal disaster and i hope we learned a big lesson in this one so that way we cannot repeat the failures that we've had i am grateful for the work that i was able to accomplish i'd like to say that it wasn't in vain but i'm not so sure now so grateful for the job the opportunity the people that I work with, some of the best people that I've ever worked with, you know, willing to risk everything to do what we did. So I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. If you like the video and you want to see more content like this in the future, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. This is The Armor signing out. We'll see you guys on the next one.